Those who are able to see beyond the shadows and lies of their culture will never be understood, let alone believed, by the masses. Plato In this video, we will take another look into topics of interest during the 1800s as they pertain to resets and the rewriting of history. This is meant to be a follow-up to part one, as well as other videos I have produced, but if you're tuning in for the first time, prepare yourself to consider things in a manner you never have. And keep in mind, everything happened in 100 years while this was the main form of transportation worldwide. Welcome back to Geomancy. It's great to be back. Hopefully you know what I already do, but if you don't, we look at anomalous things throughout history and ask a lot of questions. Now I'm gonna jump right into this with the first topic of destruction. Again, we gotta put things into context. While so much was happening, it seems as though there was cataclysm and destruction at every single turn. There were fires, floods, earthquakes, the mini ice age, so many different things were taking place that really don't have any explanation. Now here's a list of fires worldwide in the 19th century. And interestingly, many of them were in the United States, okay? Some of these just destroyed a couple buildings. Some of these destroyed hundreds or thousands of buildings. And myself and others get the feeling that these fires were not accidental, they were intentional to destroy the remnants of the past, of what we call the old world. Now let's check out the San Francisco fire of 1851, for example, which was the biggest fire San Francisco ever happened. We are told 1849 was when pioneers showed up with pickaxes and shovels looking for gold, but somehow the whole city was well built out and established in just a few years, okay? Now this fire destroyed about three quarters of San Francisco and was, was the costliest and deadliest fire in the city. Now, it wasn't the only one. There were apparently seven severe fires. There was also one in 1863. It's interesting to note that in such a short time, they were able to build out the city, then it burned down, and then rebuild it. Now, why is this interesting? Because I showed in my very first video, a little over a year ago, this panorama of San Francisco. And I mean, first of all, it's extremely high def if you haven't seen it, but we see a very well-established city, a very well-built city, robust buildings, homes, mansions, churches, cathedrals, you name it. What we don't see are any people or any signs of life other than a few horses sitting around. Of course, like in the last video, critics will say, the photography technology at the time, yeah, I'm not buying that, okay? And there are a lot of reasons why I don't buy that explanation. But it wasn't just fires that burned out places such as San Francisco and the West Coast. We also have floods all over. Now, the Great Flood of 1862 was the largest flood in the recorded history of the West Coast of the United States. And it inundated the Western part of this country. Weeks of rain. I wonder what the climate change alarmists would say about this. Um, you know, was it all the, the horses methane causing clouds? I don't know. But we do know that there's destruction all over the place with little explanation. Okay. Now, given the fact that there are these kinds of cataclysms taking place, that would lead to the displacement of people and even, you know, parents getting separated from their children, etc. Which leads us to the next topic, orphans. Many researchers cover this topic of orphans and the orphan trains. So for the sake of that, 
we're not going to dive too deeply into it. You could research this all day and find interesting stories about this. But we're going to touch on a couple things, okay? Now, this comes from the Orphan Train Heritage Society of America, which was founded in 1986. They tell us that between 1854, the golden time period, and 1929, nearly a quarter of a million homeless or orphaned children were sent west from eastern cities, accompanied by agents. Hmm. Agents. Now, they had to find these children families and homes and basically get them started and situated into the new way of life. Could it be that these children were either displaced from fires, floods, etc.? Or could it be that they were created? I'm not sure. But I find it interesting when I'm doing this research on orphans and orphan trains, the lack of orphans that look like myself. This led me to do some more research, and this comes from the National Orphan Train Complex in Kansas. They have a really interesting video on children of color on the orphan train. Now, there were not many, and um, this video is about 45 minutes long. It's not super interesting, and it's certainly not old world focused, but if you want some more context into these children of color on the orphan trains, I will link this below. Now, the other side of the orphans is the topic of baby incubators, right? And we wonder, hmm, were humans created? Now, this is coming from the History Channel by an author named Aaron Blakemore, which is an interesting name. Blakemore meaning Blackamore. But anyway, we're told that during the World's Fairs, a lot of these incubator technologies were released into the public. And a strange man by the name of Martin Cooney got started in Coney Island. His history and backstory is puzzling. Little is known about him. He allegedly came from Poland in 1869, said he had a medical license, but he would have been too young at the time of his emigration. And he pioneered this incubator technology and got started with a lot of, um, you know, th helped thousands of babies, we are told. Now, many of us wonder, where did these babies come from? Were they created? What happened to their parents? Where were their mothers? What is the deal? And is this part of the repopulation agenda after the reset of the 16, 17, and 1800s, where we went from the old world to our current reality? I'm sure some of you viewers might know somebody who came from these incubators. It's a very interesting topic. It's pretty touchy too, and much has been done. But here we see these infantoriums were an attraction at some of these world's fairs. Now, let me ask you this. Would you trust that man with your child? I don't know. Some channels such as Mind Unveiled have done exceptional work on the postcards, the Cabbage Patch Kids, and really just asking interesting questions about where these babies come from. Again, we don't see any babies that look like myself. It seems to be just to repopulate the realm with new life. Now, the other side of this topic is insanity. And we seem to find as much as there is life being created and repopulated, there are a lot of people who are getting thrown into almshouses, um, insane asylums, etc. And it's a, it's a heartbreaking topic, honestly, when you consider that so many people were deemed insane for various things, even simple things. But since we focus on the architecture on this channel, and that as a main means of proving the narrative to be not so accurate, 
Let me show you some of the architecture and some of the stories about these insane asylums, okay? Now, where do you think this is? If you answered West Virginia, you are correct. This is an asylum located in West Virginia, looking like a palace, okay? It does not look like an insane asylum. It looks like a, a royal palace or something down to the Antiquitec. And on this channel, we study architectural features. We study a lot of the details of these buildings because God is in the details. So what do we notice here? You see Dutch gables. And I've covered this extensively. I've shown so many buildings in person and throughout history that feature this type of gable. And one of these towns in Belgium, Bozinga up there, has the same crest as my logo, the Moor's Head. I think we're getting closer to who's responsible for these types of buildings. And then they were kicked out or made to leave or whatever. We don't really know what happened, but newcomers came in and repurposed the old. So let's learn about this building. This is the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. I don't know, man. So it was open from 1864 to 1994, also known as the Weston State Hospital. And the design of it began in 1858 and it was based on the Thomas Kirkbride plan. Now, Thomas Kirkbride is the pioneer of asylum architecture, you could say. And essentially, I believe he was responsible for repurposing these types of buildings into as insane asylums. They were already there, but you figured, hey, they would be great to house all of the divergence and people who are not going along with the plan or the people that were experiments gone wrong after our repopulation trials. Now, it would be one thing if this was just the only asylum like it, but I'm going to show you a couple others and you tell me if it's a castle or if it's crazy. What do you think? They all feature amazing style of architecture, very robust, royal. Now, right here, this is the Richardson Olmsted complex. And what we know about this place is it was designed by Henry Hobson Richardson and Frederick Wall Olmsted. They joined forces here and designed this, which is the New York State Asylum for the Insane. I'm not sure. Now, I've never actually been to one of these asylums, but I have had the chance to see a building that looks similar to it. And this is the St. Gabriel's Hall in Audubon, Pennsylvania, which is not too far from where I live. Now, the story we we're told about this place is that it was founded in 1898. And essentially, rather than an asylum for the insane, this was a place for wayward boys, basically boys with rough backgrounds who were on the brink of society. And it was a rehabilitation place to get them back, get, give them skills to learn to be functioning members of society. OK. And we don't have much history about the building. We don't have a lot of history about the actual design of what we see. But this place was in existence, in operation, up until 2020, okay? And I have actually shown this in a previous video of mine, but for the sake of right now, I'm gonna show you. I wasn't supposed to be here. There were signs that said no trespassing, etc. but hey, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. And I'm doing it for you. It's a really amazing building. The brickwork, as you can see, Exceptional, exceptional for any time period, let alone the late 1800s, let alone for wayward youth. I mean, again, this is like a castle. This is like a little 
palace. And this is the same type of structure that we can find all over the place with the same level of quality and detail. There's all kinds of things, smokestack, chimneys, looks like manufacturing buildings. Really neat. All for wayward youth. Now here we have a bricked up, um, bricked up entrance, clearly. And you can see two types of brick being used, facade brick and structural brick. And both are really good quality brick. Very interesting. Now, next we're going to look at some politics of the 1800s. And in the previous video, I ran over the Civil War. We talked about that and some of the strange things that we find about it as it was probably the biggest political event in the United States of the 1800s. And on the left, obviously, you've got our Union Republican leader, Abraham Lincoln. And on the right, you have our Confederate Democrat leader, Jefferson Davis, both of them looking very strange and very similar. But I mentioned how the hidden hand seems to show up all throughout this war and makes us ask questions. What was this about? Who were they? What were they doing? Okay. And this is something that we can see from leaders and thinkers of that century all over, regardless of affiliation. Whenever you see this being shown, don't take it at face value. Don't take what they say or do at face value because there's levels deeper, okay? But let's talk about Andrew Jackson, another very polarizing figure of the 1800s. Now, he was born in North Carolina, but he his political prominence was in the state of Tennessee. He was most notable, unfortunately, for what's known as the Trail of Tears, and that's kicking out the original inhabitants of the Southeast United States and sending them to Oklahoma, okay? While a politician at Tennessee, he is revered all over the state, including at the Tennessee State Capitol. Now, the Tennessee State Capitol in Nashville is a very interesting capital, and Nashville happens to be known as Athens of the South, for what it's worth. But... It's one of the few state capitals that does not have a dome. Instead, it has that tower. And, um, you know, the history of this building, the construction of it, as expected, is very mysterious. Very mysterious. So why don't we just go take a look? The Tennessee State Capitol, which was completed in 1859, remains today as it did then a magnificent accolade to the people of the great state of Tennessee. This graceful structure was designed by William Strickland, a notable architect of his time. He considered the Tennessee State Capitol to be his crowning achievement. When he died in 1854, he was buried in the northeast corner in a tomb of his own design. The cornerstone was laid on July 4th, 1845, but the final project was not completed until 1859. The Capitol has a rusticated basement. The ionic porticos at each end resemble their erechtheum in Athens, and the tower or cupola is patterned after the choragic monument of the Lysicrates in Athens. The capital was constructed of Bigsby limestone from a nearby quarry located near what is now 13th and Charlotte Avenues. This is where it gets good. The limestone was excavated, shaped, and transported by enslaved African Americans and convict labor under the supervision of stonemasons. 
The interior used marble from around Rogersville, Tennessee and Knoxville, Tennessee, while the cast iron work and gaslight fixtures were ordered from Philadelphia. The original ceiling contains frescoes painted by two German immigrant artists, Theo Nock and John Schleicher. Strickland's plans for the structure included three levels, the crypt, now the ground floor, the basement, the executive floor, and the first floor, the legislative floor. The crypt was originally designed as an armory and for fuel storage. The basement originally contained the chambers of the Supreme Court and the offices of the governor and other governmental officials. The first floor housed the chambers of the House of Representatives with attached committee rooms, the Senate chambers, and the State Library. In the 1860s, landscaping plans for the Capitol grounds were disrupted by the Civil War. When the Tennessee State Capitol became the first in the South to fall to the Union Army, military Governor Andrew Johnson used the fortified building as the government seat for Union occupation. Federal occupation ended in July of 1865. Now I could keep reading. This is from the actual visitor guide that I got here, but let's just talk about what we see. This is an unbelievable building. And you know, I've been in many of these old world buildings, but this, oh man. And they want to tell us it was built by slave labor. Whenever you find that, explanation historically, you can be sure that something is not adding up. It just doesn't make sense. Who were these slaves? I think they're telling us truth while covering it in a lie. Now there are tunnels beneath this building. This tunnel goes all the way across the street to one of the first shots that I showed of it, about a half a mile underground. And it keeps going and going. The second tunnel goes out to the first floor, to the ground level. And they were recently renovated. I think one of the troopers said a couple years ago, so you can tell this is pretty fresh. But imagine that. It's pretty notable that most state capitals are situated upon a hill. And I would suspect that most state capitals probably have tunnels beneath them leading to other parts of the city that they're in. Now, this is where things get interesting. In this tunnel, here we have, in 1911, a stunt driver driving a Model T. Look at these hooligans, okay? These do not look like the original people responsible for the building. Now, in 1880, to celebrate 100 years of Tennessee, same thing. Look at these hooligans. I think we're getting a clue that these people took over the building. They had nothing to do with the construction. The original people were displaced, erased, and what was theirs was taken. Now this is coming out of the exit, but this building is truly magnificent. Wouldn't you agree? Next, we're gonna talk about business but not in the typical sense that you may expect, such as the barons who started big industry. We're gonna talk about a little known person who made a big impact in Philadelphia, especially. Now, if you've watched a lot of my content, you might recall the video where I gave a glimpse into this. This is James Fortin, a man who few people know anything about, myself included. However, 
on the last day of this exhibit, I went and learned a lot about him and his story. What caught my eye when I was driving past the initial time was his head and how it's depicted like a Moore's head, which I showed in my very first video. As you can see here, these are examples from Europe. But also, my Geomancy logo, which is my head, depicted as a Moore's head. Very interesting. Now, James Fortin was a sailor, a sailmaker, a merchant, an investor, a businessman, a landlord, an essayist, an abolitionist. Basically, he was that dude in Philadelphia. He was a free black American, or as they say, an African American, but that is a misnomer. And I will, I will dive into that in future videos. But wherever you see African American, that's to lead us astray. He was an American with dark skin, okay? A copper colored Negro, you could say. In fact, he opposed the American Colonization Society, which was a group set up to send black Americans to the continent of Africa. Now, because we're talking in the context of historical resets, a lot of the reshuffling of people was a result of the old world becoming a new world. And we know from this document, which I featured before, that Ben Franklin, another Philadelphia dude, in 1751 was concerned with increasing mankind or a kind of man, like a variation. And in his last few paragraphs of this long essay, he straight up says, the number of purely white people in the world is proportionably very small. So his concern is increasing the white race, as he says. But the most interesting thing comes in the last few sentences where he talks about the inhabitants of Mars and Venus, which he refers to as superior beings. Why should they darken the, the globe? I think this is telling us something about the inhabitants of Mars and Venus and the impact they had when it comes to this reset. I know it sounds crazy, but if Ben Franklin is saying it and he's one of the most revered statesmen in history, I think we all need to look at this a little bit deeper. Nonetheless, a few decades later, James Fortin is born and eventually he becomes one of the most successful and wealthy businessmen in Philadelphia. So in this section, I'm gonna actually Let's learn be quiet for the most part because there's a lot to see and a lot to read, but I will chime in when necessary. A lot of primary documents, according to them. I mean, they could be fakes or copies, but very interesting stuff about this man, James Fortin. And it's a, it's a contrast to what many of us are taught about Black Americans at this time period. I mean, I attended some of the best schools and institutions, including one that I featured of that list of elite universities in the previous video. And never do we learn about these types of people and that they were just one of many. We always hear the slave narrative. We always hear the, the, the struggle and the victim, but never about these very successful people at a time when the cards seem to be stacked against them. Seems that with James Fortin, they don't really know what he looked like. And I think that's interesting. It's very, very interesting. But again, he was not the only wealthy black entrepreneur in Philadelphia. There were numerous. Who else were there? This is just what they're dishing to us now.
And again, if as Ben Franklin says, the number of purely white people in the world is proportionably very small, how would it be that they were the ones who so quickly took everything over? I don't think I believe that either. Now, here you can see how he opposed the ACS, basically said, why should we go back to Africa when that's not where we're from? Now, my video mapping the old world, I compared maps of North America and Africa throughout centuries and showed that they're not the same place as they are today. That's a big clue. His son helped recruit many soldiers for the Civil War. Man, look at Frederick Douglass. He does not look like a Negro to mess with. And here you can see some wartime propaganda from the era. an artifact from the Civil War. Again, if it's legit, I mean, I don't believe anything. I just understand as much as I can. So they tell us that the United States government tried to reconstruct, in quotes, the nation. Well, why would they do that? Because this was post-reset. Reconstruction is not exactly what we were taught. Now, I'm going to end on this artifact. James Fortin and many businessmen and influential people donated money to have this monument created in honor of the War of 1812. So this was created in 1812, we are told. Now, just look at the craftsmanship and the precision of this. Tell me it's not laser etched. Please tell me that it is not laser etched and that things like this are possible by hand. And then show me an example. This is just stunning. Amazing. And the last thing I noticed as I was walking away is this shirt that said Liberty with a crescent moon. And if you know your symbols, you know the crescent moon. We're gonna end with religion, but we're not gonna talk about all the different religions of the 1800s. We're not gonna go too deep into any one religion. I'm just gonna share an anomalous story and, and place that I found, okay? This is Father Eusebio Kino, who was a Jesuit missionary. Now that right there should tell you he was a resetter because the Jesuit missionaries, yeah, they, they did a lot. However, Father Kino did a lot. He was born in the German speaking area of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, remember who the patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire was, okay? It's that brown brother right there, Saint Maurice. And again, Ben Franklin said in that essay, the Germans were swarthy. That's, that's brown. That's like this, okay? Just like Saint Maurice. However, moving on with Father Kino. One thing that's very interesting is this map. He was a cartographer and he was the one or one of a few who said that Mexican Indians could easily access California by sea, a view taken with skepticism by missionaries in Mexico City. And this 1696 map you see right there depicts California as an island, just as I showed in mapping the old world. Now, this Jesuit missionary, Father Kino, was a big contributor to this ideology. And then later afterwards, they said, no, 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 no. I think what happened was after the cataclysm, the sea disappeared, it dried up. But let's talk about one of the most 
famous missions that he founded, Mission San Xavier del Bac. This is located in Southern Arizona, and it has a very strange history, okay? Now, the current mission was built between 1783 and 1797. However, we are told that in the 1800s, the Mexican government banned all Spanish-born priests and the mission was vacant. Then with the Gadsden Purchase of 1853, which was where a part of New Mexico and Arizona and I think Nevada became part of the United States, this mission became part of the United States and it was reopened in 1859. Again, this 1850s time period seems to be the golden era of when things are restarting. After what? Well, let's find out. So you can see that this is a Moorish design. Again, look at the gables. And this place is in the middle of nowhere. It's literally in the desert. And it is so ornate and fancy. I happened to be there on a Sunday when mass was in session. Remember that quote about the masses that I opened with. Now, this is a hill just off the side of it that is essentially a sacred hill. And look up there. Does that look like melted brick to you? If not, hang on, we got some more things to show you. What I notice is the rock of this hill looks like igneous rock. That is volcanic rock. And you can see, it even looks rusty also. And one thing that I can sense metaphysically is the magnetism of this place which is why so many people are drawn to it, which would explain the magnetic nature. But these lions, look at the date that we have on them. Now, it looks like a pile of rubble, but piecing it together with some things that other researchers are doing and talking about, I think I'm starting to get the feeling that there was some extreme cataclysm that happened, causing it to be what it is. The place is amazing. And I think this guy knows what went down, right? Now again, me being me, I like to sneak where no one else is just to get a better view. And this is the backside of the mission. Look at these rocks. How do you think that's formed in the desert? Now, we get a little description on the building materials and that they use prickly pear juice to create the plaster. But we also get a little indication that the building was restored in 1906. Hmm. It's a pretty ornate, immaculate place. Very beautiful. Truly outstanding. And quite unusual. Given that it's in the desert. We have our cross patty symbol, Antiquatech. I want you to comment what you think happened here if you buy the narrative and what it could mean as it pertains to these other facets of the gem that I've put together. Well, that was a lot, but thank you for watching if you have stayed to the end. I really appreciate the support that my channel has gotten for only doing 18 videos thus far. I never would have thought I'd be as many subscribers as I currently have. I mean, I'm doing this for me, but I'm also doing it for you. And 
hopefully you can take the research and the work that I'm doing and integrate it with your own studies and make more sense of what the heck is going on. If you are interested in donating, I will leave some information in the description. My channel is not monetized. I'm not going to allow YouTube to pay me for this because honestly, I'm being led. However, if you would like to donate something because you get value, by all means, please like, comment, subscribe, and certainly share this with somebody. Take care, be very well, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.